Anita's talking in our ears this morning, and my answer to her is yes. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. So we do have one announcement that I know of this morning, and that is we have a talent show on June 30th. I think we have several people signed up. I know our wonderful sax player here is sound up, signed up, but guess what? I don't think he's going to play sax. I think he's going to sing. Ah. Okay. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Um, Anita, do you know how many we have signed up? Six. 
Oh. Actually, there's about 11 people on the list. 11 people. It's going to be good, y'all. So everybody needs to be here June 30th, which is next Sunday, at what time? If you're in the talent show, you need to be here at 4.30. If you, we're eating at 5. Got it. 5.30. Okay. Just be here somewhere around there. <laughs> so, yeah. It'll be fun. Leave. Yeah, come and eat and don't leave. So, the other announcement I've been giving is our Hope Group is going to have something special in the fellowship hall June 25th at 1130. I believe that's a Tuesday. This Tuesday. This Tuesday. We're going to be learning about yoga and stretching with Melissa Engelmeyer. <coughs> now, I've heard from Miriam that you're not actually going to, like, do yoga. You're going to learn about breathing and that kind of thing. And you're going to eat. Oh, that's not on the sheet. So remember that. You get to eat. So, 1130 this coming Tuesday, right here in the Fellowship Hall. It'll be fun. Melissa is in here with a group every Friday around 11, and they're doing yoga. And yoga is good, y'all. I do it, too. So, it's, it's, um, it's great. It's great for your health, great for your breathing, great for your relaxation. <laughs> so, I um, hope to see you all there. Um, now, in the meantime, I hope we got you in the mood to praise God this morning. I hope everybody's doing great this morning. While the children are making their way with Miss Jillian and Miss Christian to Children's Church, um, except for one, because we have a very special treat for you this morning, if you haven't looked at your bulletins already. Um, let's stand and praise God together.
Good morning. Great to see you all. My goodness. Something special about today. I don't know what it is. I felt the vibe when I walked in the room. I think the special is you. It must be. Someone said to me, you've got a cool vibe going on. I said, no, it's, it's the vibe in the room. There's something about the energy, and I love the music, and just so much about this atmosphere. I'm expecting great things. Are you expecting great things? Amen. Amen. We're here for different reasons. We have different things going on in our lives. Some of us are here because we've been at this church, unless we were out of town or sick or caring for someone, we've been here every Sunday our whole lives. For some of us, we are newcomers. For some of us, our parents dragged us here. For others, the kids dragged their parents here. For some of us, we are here because we need a word from God. What does that mean, a word from God? What does that even mean, a word from God? To hear from God. Sometimes God gives us an actual word, a word that we are to meditate on and contemplate and to, in some ways, wrestle with. A literal word. For some of us, it's a message in general. For some of us, it's an experience. For some of us, it's a sense but it is a communication that comes from God, and it's just what we need when we need it. This I do know, that whatever our need, God is the one to meet it. We were singing a few moments ago, Christ is enough for me, and that's a familiar song, and sometimes when there are things that are familiar to us, it doesn't have the same impact or impression, but as we were singing that song, it was just reverberating through me and I was thinking how true that is Christ is enough for me beyond like that platitude because some of us we come to church and we use church language and that sounds like something church what folks would say doesn't it Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for us and all of us no matter how focused we try to be we forget that sometimes and we're looking for enough, we're looking for more, we're looking for wholeness some other place. But that's what I love about both the discipline and the joy of gathering here on a regular basis where we remind one another that Christ really is enough. My hope and my prayer is that for all of us this morning, we come to a greater knowledge, a greater insight, a greater experience, a greater sense of what it means when we say even Christ. That's not Jesus' last name. That is one of the many realities of who he is. He is the Son of God. He is the very embodiment, the incarnation of who God is. For some of us, again, that sounds like churchy language. And so I hope that we're able to get beyond that. For some of us, we've had bad experiences with church, and we're just now getting the courage to be back in a church context. Christ is deliverer. Christ is rescuer. Christ really is savior in the whole sense of that word. Christ is the one that gives us meaning. Christ is the one who heals us, even when there's no cure. Christ is the one that will walk with us all the way, all the way through this life, and walk with us as we transition to the next. Christ will never leave us alone. Christ reflects who God is. God would have been too transcendent for us, too wholly other, had it not been for Jesus. But because of Jesus, the one who was wholly other and transcendent is very near. We could not have known who God is apart from Jesus. Not fully. And God loves us so much that God, the transcendent one, actually takes on human form and takes on this experience. God didn't have to do that. But in a sense, it is in God's very nature to do so. 
because as we've heard so often, God is love and all that that means. And we're going to discuss that a little bit later. Let's go to God in prayer together. Gracious and loving God, we are indeed privileged to be in this place. You are the great gift giver, and we know that it is a gift that we can physically be here, that we are well enough to be here. And yet we know we are not completely whole. And so we are here seeking more of you. You are the source of all that is good. So help us to open our hearts, our minds. For some of us, our minds is a hindrance. Our minds are a hindrance. Help us just for a moment to suspend a doubt that would prevent you from penetrating our hearts and spirits. We welcome the questions, and we know you do too. But open us up just to the possibility even. Those of us who have encountered you, we know that if we'll give you just a crack, just an opening, you'll make your way to us. We thank you that you are the initiator, that you are seeking us before we even know to seek you, that you're always right there. That those impulses, those inklings that we have of you, help us to begin to trust them. For those who are here this morning who are carrying difficult burdens, dif difficult weights. We ask that we could trust to place them at your feet, to put them down, give them to you. You are the one who can make a way where there is no way. You are the one who does make a way where there is no way. You are the giver of wisdom. You are the giver of insight. You are the giver of wholeness and healing. And so we are entrusting ourselves to you. As we continue with our worship service, we do turn our attention to your son. We're seeking more of you by looking to him. As we turn our attention to your son, we know that we are inspired by your Holy Spirit. You are our counselor. You walk beside us, in front of us. You whisper to us things that we do not know on our own. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Empower us beyond our finite capabilities. We are finite, but you are infinite. Empower us through the teachings of Jesus. Empower us through the gift of prayer, even the prayer that Christ taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite those who are serving to come forward at this time. For those who are visiting with us, we want to let you know that you are so very welcome here. Couldn't help but reach out and hug her as she walks by. You are so very welcome here. You're welcome here beyond the invitation and the statement, you are welcome here. We are all welcome here. We're welcome to participate in every offering this morning. Not because we merit it or deserve it in the sense that we've earned it. But we deserve it because God is the one who decides what we deserve. God does not love us because we are worthy. We are worthy because God loves us.
say that to yourself sometime. This morning, and I hesitate to share this with you each Sunday morning, I pray before I come in here. And there's always this moment where I recognize my own inadequacies, my own incompetencies, my own inabilities to communicate fully. And if God doesn't show up, I'm sunk. And sometimes my life, for those of you who know me at all, know that I'm imperfect in so many ways. And so there are those moments of almost panic and feeling of unworthiness. I was saying that word, unworthy, this feeling of unworthiness. And it's so wonderful once we have that insight and that grasp of God, God will rush in and remind us that it's not about what we've earned. It's about God's love for us. I hope and pray you know how much God loves you or that you get an insight in it because you're never going to know fully until the hereafter. But I hope you get a glimpse. And a glimpse, boy, that'll get you through the day when you realize how much God loves you. When you realize how much God loves your loved ones, when you realize... This life, as wonderful it is, and it is a gift. And I'm not saying this because I'm the preacher. <laughs> it just gets better. And all that is good that you experience is just going to get better. So we have an opportunity to respond to the offering of communion where we are reminded that God will take on human form to demonstrate to us just how much God loves us. And I use that word demonstrate on purpose. God will show us how much God loves us. We have an opportunity. For some of us, this is not a good season in the sense that we are struggling. We're going through difficult times. And sometimes it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And so we have an opportunity to respond to the ministry of prayer. And we can light a candle. Remember that Christ, the light of the world, shines in the darkness. Christ, the light of the world, shines in the darkness, and the darkness, no matter how dark, will never, ever, 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 ever overcome the light. And then we have an opportunity. It is a gift to give. So if you are feeling so led, you're invited to respond to these three offerings. Um, Jacob said something that sometimes God puts, maybe just put a word in our heart. And interestingly enough, this morning, when I was reading over the scriptures that would be a part of the service today, that happened to me. The two words were exclusion and friends. And so I started thinking about exclusion, and one of the reasons I love this church it's because part of our church is no one is excluded. We don't make that decision. That's not our decision to make. Jacob talks about everyone is welcome here, and everyone is welcome here. The other word was friends. And I thought about our table, and I thought about our own table. And we would never, ever invite friends over for dinner. And when it came down, time to sit down, have a friend who came to that table, and there was no seat there. We wouldn't do that. And we don't do that here at this table. There is no one we exclude. Everyone is welcome here to share in the joy that Jesus gives all of us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here together in an inclusive environment that brings everyone in and where everyone is welcomed at your table. Let us all remember as we break this bread and drink this wine, that we're making a promise to you that we will go out into the world with your love and 
and share that with all. gifts of God for the people of God.
I was saying that a word comes through sometimes a little word, an actual word, a literal word. Sometimes it comes through a voice. My goodness, what a gift. How proud I know all of you are and what a wonderful family and all that you do and all that you are in your very presence. You are so special and we're so grateful for you. We have, it has been our privilege to fulfill part of last week's message. And last week's message is we were looking at the great commandments. And part of it is to love God with all of our hearts. The last few moments, that's been easy, hasn't it? Now we're going to turn our attention to a degree to loving God with our minds, which is so very important as well. God has given us the gift of reason so that we can know God through reason as well. We can know God in so many ways. And for the last few weeks, we've been looking at greatness, generally speaking, and we recognize that we are called to strive for greatness. It is the calling of each one of us. I believe that we are all children of God, and as children of God, God places a desire within us to strive for greatness. Jesus was one who knew what it meant to strive for greatness. And in fact, we look to Jesus primarily as the one who reveals to us what it means to strive for greatness. When we're talking about striving, we're talking about giving our devotion, our commitment, our energy, our discipline, our focus, our passion towards something that's extremely important. And we phrased that reality that we're pursuing as greatness because greatness is a word that is often used in our society. Being born into this society, we're taught to strive for greatness. We're taught to pursue important goals. We're taught to be in pursuit of success. And greatness is one of those words that used is used so very often, but we need to come to a better understanding of it, particularly from a biblical, faithful understanding. So we've been discussing the greats. Now, very quickly, let's review, because there are a number of people who are, have not been here. We looked at the great requirement. Who has a Bible with you at this moment? Someone have a book. Can I see it for a second? Have any of you ever been intimidated by this book? There are a lot of words in this book. I love that Sheila studies hers. Lots of underlining and markings. This is a thick book. And it's not always easy to comprehend, is it? How many of you have ever struggled to comprehend the Bible? How many of you have ever struggled to comprehend particular passages of the, of the Bible? If you ever had one of those, I'll speak slang, say what? <laughs> Moments. So how do we go about it even? And that's part of what we're doing over these past few weeks and this morning. We're looking at the greats. And Jesus can focus us on how to navigate Scripture. And then there are occasionally statements that are made that help frame the Bible as well. So... People who were very devoted to God and wanted to fulfill God's will and suffering from the same condition that you and I have would make mistakes and they wanted to be one with God again. That's what atonement means. It means at one meant atonement. So they had various rituals and sacrifices. They would offer atonement rituals and sacrifices because they wanted to, their relationship to God to be restored. And sometimes they would think in terms of offerings and grain offerings and burnt offerings. And so the prophet Micah says, He has told you, O mortal, what does the Lord require of you? And so for those of you who have been here, the great requirement, what does God require of us? To do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with our God. We 
are gifted with the Holy Spirit. For some of us, that seems like a strange statement. For others of us, once we have experienced the Holy Spirit, it doesn't seem hokey or strange. It's nothing scary. It is the empowerment of God, the presence of God, the very presence of God. And God has given us generally the gift of the Holy Spirit, and God has given each of us gifts. And we are all called to contribute, to share, and in so doing, we also find our fulfillment. So for some of us, there's this longing at various seasons of our lives because we want to be doing something, and when we do that, we fi find ourselves fulfilled. And those callings and those gifts can change over the course of our lives because our circumstances change. God is the God of eternity, but God is the God of the present. God is constant, but God can respond to constantly changing circumstances in our lives particularly and in our lives collectively. But we are to pursue the greater gifts. And what are the greater gifts? Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Whatever our gift, if it's not in love, then we're using it in a way that God hasn't called us to use it, because we all have gifts, and gifts can be misused. A gift is the power of God. Power is neutral. Power is the ability to achieve purpose. We can use our gift to fulfill God's purposes, or we can use our gifts to do those things that are contrary to God's purposes. And so one of the things we want is the wisdom and wisdom, most fundamentally, is the will of God. How to know what the will of God is in any particular moment or circumstance. And for some of us, we could be operating out of our gifts unintentionally in ways that are contrary to the will of God. So we want to be careful about that. This is one of the ways we can know, though, if we're using our gifts correctly. If it is a gift that is inspired by love, it is encouraging, it is consoling, and it is constructive. We're going to talk about constructive in just a few moments. But it is encouraging, it is consoling, and it is constructive. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you want to know a little bit more about it. It's talking about the gift of prophecy, but I believe that includes all gifts if they're used in the proper way. Beginning in chapter 12, for those of you who are not as familiar, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there's a list that's not exhaustive of the gifts. But love is supposed to permeate all of those gifts. And then last week we saw, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm going to remind you one more time because some of us need to be reminded. For some of us, we're angry at God. God can handle it. God can handle your anger. God wants a real relationship with you. You don't have to pretend like you're not angry with God if you're angry with God. And some of us go through those seasons. I've been there. Some of you may be in it right now. You can tell God just what you think of God. And that's not going to change the way God feels about you or thinks about you. For some of us, we're, we're struggling to love another. And I would just say this. It is an act of the will before it is an experience of the emotions. It is an act of the will before it is an experience of the emotions. Love is not primarily about how we feel. For some of us, we've been hurt badly. I'm not saying that love requires an affectionate feeling toward another. We're going to talk about this more in just a moment, but love is an unconditional commitment to the good of the other. Sometimes, love and godlike love means truly wishing the best for someone, but sometimes love re requires not actually being in a direct relationship with someone. That can be a form of love. That may be another message in itself. But then for some of us, we love God, we love others, but we're struggling to love ourselves. And I would remind you that it is a commandment. Now that seems like a burden in a sense of an obligation, but it's really God's commandment to set us free. We may not like ourselves sometimes, but we're commanded to love ourselves. And so one of the ways we do that is by reminding ourselves of God's love for us, to changing the dialogue that goes on in our minds. You notice sometimes that dialogue is going on in your mind and you're not even paying attention to it directly. Have you ever noticed that? Like the thoughts are going, but that's part of the gift of being 
created in God's image, we can transcend our own thoughts. We can, we can observe our own thoughts. And when we catch ourselves talking to ourselves, treating ourselves contrary to the way of love, then we can change that dialogue. We can change what we're thinking about ourselves. And one of the ways we do that, and I'm going to say this and we're moving on, but all this is important. It really is, and we want to internalize this. We recognize the objective reality of God's love. What does that mean? God's love for us is. That is settled. That is true. That is reality. Capital R, reality. And so we are reconditioning ourselves. We have a human condition. We are reconditioning ourselves to see ourselves as God sees us by aligning our thoughts with the way God sees us. Everybody see that? So we can, as an act of the will, make a decision to do those three things. Love God, love others, love ourselves. And then again, our emotions, which are secondary, can catch up with the decision that we've made and then that we practice over and over and over, and it's important to practice it. So this morning we're going to talk about the new commandment. So I invite you, where's my sermon? It's in my pocket. I invite you to look at your bulletin, and we're going to read what I believe to be the most important statements among the most, most, very most important statements in all the Bible. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And then in chapter 15, he's been talking about, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, abide in my love. And then he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That's an important statement, isn't it? This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from the Father. May your lives be transformed by the reading and hearing of these words. Amen. Loretta said something at the table that I want to say this. This was not part of the message, and I'm going to say it quickly. Um, she said something during the message about friends. And I had not thought about the way you phrased it, Loretta. I always thought about Jesus anticipating what he was getting ready to go through. That's the way I primarily thought about it. He was getting ready to face things we don't even want to imagine. And I always thought about the burden of that. But you, you pulled out the paradox of this passage, even in the midst of what he was getting ready to face, he was experiencing profound joy because of the love that he had with those he was with. And that's the way life is sometimes, isn't it? We're carrying extraordinary burdens, and yet there's joy because of the love that we have for one another. So we've talked already just a little bit about what frames the Bible. Now, for some of you, this may be a little bit controversial. For others of you, it may not. For some of us, we struggle to know what the Word of God is. What is the Word of God? We are supposed to be responsive to the Word of God. The Word of God is the place we would look as the highest authority for how we live our lives. I doubt that many people who would consider themselves Christians, believers, followers, disciples, would argue that point. Beyond that, we struggle, don't we? To know exactly what that means. The Word of God. Are all of the words in the Bible, do they all carry equal weight? Some would say yes. 
But Jesus himself occasionally would say, I know it's been said, but I say. And he offers a new commandment. If the words leading up to that point have been sufficient, why would he offer a new one? That's a legitimate question, don't you think? And we also know that the greatest commandments, love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, love our neighbor as ourselves, on that, he said, hangs all the law and the prophets. If you do this, you've fulfilled all the law and the prophets. So we're beginning to hone into the purpose, aren't we? God's word for us. And then Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. It is my deep conviction that Jesus is the word. I love the way the gospel according to St. John, I love the way that John says it right from the beginning. And the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The word is God. And that word became incarnate. That word took on flesh. For me, Jesus is the word. And so when Jesus speaks, we need to pay close attention. And if Jesus says these are the greatest commandments, and yet I'm giving you a new one, this is the one to pay attention to. Don't you agree? That we love one another as Jesus has loved us. That, my friends is the meaning of this life. That is the purpose for which we were created. It is that simple and it is that profound. It is that simple in the sense that to love one another as God loves us, as Jesus demonstrated that God loves us, to love ourselves, love God, love one another, and even our enemies as God loves us, that is the purpose and meaning in this life. And I'm going to jump to the conclusion before I get there in case I forget. I was thinking about this. To the degree that we have progressed in that endeavor is the degree to which we have matured and grown in our spirituality. It is not primarily about a set of beliefs, faith claims, or anything else, to the degree we have made progress in loving as Jesus loves us is the degree to which we have matured and made spiritual progress. Now here's a qualifier that'll set us free. You may say, I'm not very good at it. I'll confess to you, neither am I. I wish I was better, and I'm still struggling and growing. But here is also an interesting insight that will set us free. That we have made the commitment to loving as Jesus loves us is the most important commitment we'll ever make. And that means we're now on the right road. You with me? You're on the right path. And being on the right path is so very important. That's the first step that is the most important step any of us will make. Once we've made that step, now we're striving as we grow in that. And as we grow in the love that Jesus has for us, now we're becoming great in the proper sense of the word. That is greatness from a faithful biblical perspective. And we do that in the way that God calls us to generally, and we do it in the way that God calls us to particularly. Why was Jesus sent into the world? Why was Jesus sent into the world? To save us. Any other reasons? I think that pretty well covers it. To save us. And that's right. Save us how? In all kinds of ways. To save us from our condition. To show us our true nature. To save us from fear. To save us from the thought that God is mad at us to save us from our own self-destruction, to save us from societal destruction, to save us from destroying this planet. 
Jesus was sent to save us. And how did Jesus save us? By showing us the way. We make these statements like, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by him. We make those statements because he made that statement. But when we say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, we're not talking about a superstitious name that we claim, and therefore, because we believe in Jesus, therefore we go to the Father, to God. By following his way, we are saved. By following his truth, we are saved. By following his life, we are saved. And so we want to grow in the understanding of the way that he loves us. We want to grow in the way that we understand how the cross saves us. I'm going to say this again. There is no way that we can grow. There's no way that we can be fully transformed to the degree that God wants us to in the, even in when I get really long-winded in here. There's no way. I encourage you, if you are not a part of a small group, Get into a small group, and if you would like, if there isn't one, then let me know. Let Jillian know, and let's get you, let's get, for those who are not, we'll put together a small group, and let's begin to help you pursue some of these questions, because from some of the small groups that I've participated in, particularly since I've been here, people say things like, this is church, this is church. I never knew that before. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad I knew that. I never understood that before. We can grow and we want to. We're called to strive. This is not merely a belief system. This is a matter of becoming. It's a matter of our salvation. Jesus came to save us. And we see as we're being saved, if we love as Jesus loves, then we grow in things like joy. How many of you have more joy than you can stand and you don't want any more joy in your life? You have all the peace you need. We want to grow. Jesus saves us. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So we want to know his way, his truth, his life. And one of the best ways to do that is in a small group. One of the things that gets in the way is our penultimate concerns. What's a penultimate concern? Next to. It's, concern, it's, it's important, but it's the penultimate. There's something even more ultimate. For many of us, our focus is on something slightly other than Jesus and this commandment. One of those things can be denominationalism. This doesn't apply to so many in this church thank goodness but some people are more concerned about their denomination than they are the one that their denomination is to point to even in disciples of christ where i'll tell you about for those of you who don't know the christian church disciples of christ how did we get that name our founders recognized that all this denominationalism was a scandal to the message of christianity because the message of christianity is oneness Thus, that one logo. We were called to unity. Unity is our polar star, is what we understood within our denomination. We have been, since the beginning, a movement trying to restore the oneness that Jesus prayed for. It can be the case, though, so we became the Christian church, and then we're just Christians. We're not Methodist, we're not Baptist, we're not Presbyterian, we're, not, we're just the Christian church. And they realize, well, we can't say that. We're not the Christian church. We are, in parentheses, well, we're disciples of Christ. See the qualifier there? That's how we got our name. We're not trying to be a denomination. But here's another interesting thing. If we're not careful, and it can happen so subtly, we can be more disciples of disciples of Christ than we are disciples of Christ. Did you see the difference? Some people are more disciples of disciples of Christ than they are disciples of Christ. And some people are more disciples of disciples of Christ as it existed 30, 40 years ago. We're no longer even that denomination. So we want to make sure that our denomination is not our ultimate concern. Our denomination is a means to an end. Another thing that gets in the way is our personal convictions of loving as Jesus has loved us. How are we called to love one another? As Jesus loves us. For some of us, if we have a difference over a controversial matter of the day, that's it. I'm leaving that church. They ordain those people. Women lead in that church. Mm. Can you believe that's in some churches still a controversial matter? Whatever it is, think about it. And think about how it's happened over history. Now here's a question, there's a word. Whatever the controversial matter is, this is a way to put 
it in perspective a little bit. We look back at some of the controversial matters 50 years ago, and we say, for those who were on one side of that issue, what were they thinking? Right? Think about during the Civil Rights Movement. Think about some of the, the angry faces and some of the images. And you think, what were they thinking? These were good church folks. One of the ways to frame it today is, what side of history will you be on? In 50 years from now, when people look back, where will you have been on some of these controversial matters? And this is what hi history demonstrates over and over and over again. That people who are on the right side of history are always the ones who elevate people to their proper status. History has a way of revealing God's will in the sense that whenever there was a group that was considered inferior or other, we know we've made progress when everyone's elevated to their proper status. What is the proper status of all of us? We are children of God. Everyone has the proper status. Anyone who has been treated and being treated as a lower status is being mistreated. So consider that on as we look at history. You know, I actually thought I was going to get through next week's sermon today. <laughs> another, is, another one of those hindrances is secondary loyalties. Secondary loyalties. Secondary comes right after what? Primary. So secondary is very important, isn't it? But the primary has to be the commandment of God. The primary has to be the commandment of God, whatever God requires. Sometimes, even our family loyalties can come in conflict with us loving as God loves. There may be someone in our family who does not love as God loves. And when we love someone as God loves, that may put us in conflict with someone in our family. That's the toughest, I believe. When those co close relationships come into conflict with us loving as God loves. For some of us, our nation... I'm going to say what I'm getting ready to say with fear and trembling. American patriotism and loyalty to God are not synonymous. American patriotism and loyalty to God are not synonymous. Wherever our patriotism could potentially come into conflict with our loyalty to God, which commitment is first? We have to be very careful with that. When we sing Amazing Grace, emotions are experienced, aren't they? When we sing the American Anthem, some emotions are experienced, aren't they? And while they're not identical, they're very, very similar, aren't they? Sometimes. We have to be very, very careful with that. So please, 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 we are disciples. Everyone can have their own opinion, so please don't take a congregational vote and have me kicked out after that statement. <laughs> those are the tough ones. Those are the ones that'll get, those are some of the controversial matters. Our culture, our tradition, we've already talked about that. So how does Jesus love? How does Jesus love? Absolutely unconditionally. This is n not new to any of you who have been coming for a while. Jesus loves absolutely unconditionally. And because when we believe in Jesus, there are these statements that sound like recipes for our salvation. And they're not just recipes in the sense that we often think of how we are saved. To those who believed in his name, God gave the power to become children of God. What does this mean? It's not just the name, it's the one who possessed that name that we believe in. When we believe in Jesus, we believe in unconditional love because that's how Jesus loves, absolutely unconditionally. When we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then we know that God loves us absolutely unconditionally. And we are then saved, saved from fear that God is going to get us. And for many of us, we were taught most of our lives that God was always watching like a monitor. And if we step that line, God's going to get us. 
That is not God. That is a human perception of God. God's love for us is absolutely unconditional. If you blow it for the rest of your life, God is still going to love you. You are not going to earn any more of God's love. You cannot earn any more of God's love because you've got it all. You have all of God's love. God loves only one way. Completely, wholly, unconditionally. You are never going to do anything to lose God's love. God is never, ever, ever going to change God's mind about you. When you get a sense of this, it's not a license to do anything. When you know how much God loves you, you can't help yourself but to want to grow in this love, and that is our salvation. God loves us sacrificially. God loves us to the point that God will suffer. Sometimes we are called to love people sacrificially till it costs us, until it hurts. Mother Teresa says, love until it hurts. And I love that Ray said in an elders meeting one time, and then you find you love till it hurts, and it hurts till it feels good in this sense. People who have been committed to the way of love when they're suffering, they experience an extraordinary joy. When people, particularly in a community, have decided to love sacrificially, there's a joy of knowing that God is with them in the midst of it. They know that God is with them in the midst of it. They have a true relationship with God, and they know that God is walking every step with them. It's always constructive. We said that a few moments ago. Encouraging, consoling, constructive. Does it build people up, or does it tear people down? And that's one of those matters about tough love, which leads to this next one, which is personally. Some people say, it's going to cost us, we're going to love someone with tough love, and it's going to cost me because they may not love me in return, and therefore it is sacrificial. I love them enough to make them angry, I'm going to love them with tough love, and it's going to cost me and it hurts. And I believe sometimes God calls us to that. But I also believe that we are called to love each one personally, and this is what I mean. To love as Jesus loves means that we love the actual person that we're called to love. Some of us love everyone generally and people in particular generally. And so we don't actually know what they need. We love them with what we think they need based on our limited experience or the way someone loved us that worked for us. But that was Jesus had the uncanny ability to love each one personally how they needed to be loved. There is no generic formula for how to love people. You have to, and to love someone, and love is relational, you have to know someone to know how to love them, right? For some of us, we go around trying to love everybody the way we think everybody should be loved, but we have to love personally. I'm so far out of time, so we will have next week. I invite you to stand as you're able. This really is what it is all about. Loving unconditionally, loving as Jesus loves us, this is what our whole life is about. When we make a confession of faith, that's what we've said. This is what life is about. I'm confessing that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Savior, Jesus is the Christ. That's what we're saying, that his love will save my life, his love will save my soul, his love will save me, will save this world, will save this church, will save my family, when we operate in the way of love, this is, this is how it's done. If there's anyone here who's not a member of a community of faith, this is what we are committed to. Some of us are further along on the journey, some of us are not. But we're all committing to that. That's what it means. We ask this simple statement, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Do you proclaim him as Savior? And in that statement, what we're saying is we're going to love as Jesus loves us. We're all on that journey as a community of faith. That's what we're doing. We each have an opportunity to say, have I made that step? Am I striving in that direction? And if we're not, our commitment today, our calling is to make that first step, and then we're on the right road. And then for others of us, say, look, I made that commitment, but I'm not striving. I'm going to turn it up a notch. I want to love like God loves, and I'm going to commit to it. I invite you to respond as God is calling you to respond as we sing. All right. i
surpasses all understanding, all comprehension. The love that saves us, sets us free, and makes us whole. May that love guard and sustain our hearts this day and forevermore. Amen. And all praise to the Father from Happy birthday, birthday. 